like what about gradient descent? What about machine learning causes the models that are found to be good models that generalize well? And so we wrote a paper that aims to try to understand that a little bit better by introducing a new complexity measure. And it uses ideas from geometric analysis. All righty. Thank you so much, cool. Mike, for joining our book club. It's super exciting to chat with you today about your book. Yeah, I guess let's start with a round of introductions. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll get started. My name is Sophia. I am a data scientist in Anaconda. I like to read tech books and also non-tech books. And in mm -hmm. our book club, we mostly read data science or machine learning related tech books. So. Yeah, super excited to have you here, Mike. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Munn. Again, just thanks thanks for uh, reaching out. It's nice to chat with people who are interested in, in like talking more about machine learning things. Um, I'm a I'm a research software engineer at Google. Um, before before that, I was I worked in cloud and we wrote this book. I was uh, a machine learning engineer in Google Cloud. And uh, and yeah, like I'm just it's nice to meet everyone. and. Um, yeah, and talk about machine learning. So thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Yeah, I guess so I can get started with some questions. It's very interesting you write this machine learning book as a machine learning design pattern book. Like, why do you consider structuring a book this way? It's, it's kind of interesting to me. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe I'll sort of say a little bit about like where the book came from. Yeah, so I think, you know, the idea of like a design pattern book sort of, um, you know, the idea of design pattern isn't, 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 isn't new, right? So there's a lot of design patterns in like computer science or, you know, in, in, you know, in architecture or like other, other fields. And, and the idea of, of the book was like, you know, machine learning engineers have been, you know, working for a while and like, you know, you sort of develop and once you're in the field for a while, you start to see a lot of the same kind of problems arising in one way or another, like, um, and like I mentioned before, like my role previously at Google was in a, was as a machine learning engineer in Google cloud. And so in that context, my role was like a lot of like working with cloud customers. So, you know, we'd have like a, a large enterprise or a, a business would, would, um, you know, be a Google cloud customer and they would have some, like some machine learning use case and they would sort of like hire us to help them build out um, the solution, right? So build the model and help them deploy it and all that kind of thing. And so it was, it was almost like consulting work, but, um, you know, with, with Google cloud. And so, you know, you, a lot of the projects were like shorter term, like maybe three months to six months. There were some like longer projects that lasted maybe like a year or more, but a lot of the projects were like, you know, like, like typical consulting work. And, and I think what happened was, you know, just after seeing so many customer use cases and like so many machine learning use cases, you start to see like a lot of patterns emerging. And so in, th in that sense, it made a lot of, it made a lot of sense to, to write a book about machine learning design patterns because, you know, the design pattern is really just a, a common solution to a common problem. And, you know, at that stage, we had all come across like, you know, lots of, lots of problems. And so talking with Lack and Sarah, you know, L L you know, I think L Lack was definitely the spearhead of the, of, of the book. Like it was his idea to, to sort of compile these, these ideas into a single resource. Um, you know, but like talking through like what design patterns to include and like how, how to structure the book, it made a lot of sense that it was like, you know, there's a gap in the literature, a place to say like, you know, a lot of people are working on machine learning. Um, so it's a, the goal was also to like to have like a, a, a shared language of, of like, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't talk to colleagues and, you know, you know, I, they would have some problem in machine learning that they're working with. And I would be, you know, trying to help them, help them with that, you know? And so it's like, you know, they may, they may have, you know, some issue, like one of, one of the design patterns we discussed in the book is like uh, the bridge schema. It's like, you know, you're, you have two data sets, like, you know, come from different sources. Maybe they, they've changed over time. How do you create a single schema that sort of like encapsulates the old data and the new data? And so like, that's a common problem that arises because of, you know, the, the, the evolution of data in, in like large corporate enterprises. Um, and so we want, we, but we gave it a name. We call it like, the, we call it the, the, the bridging schema. And so it's like, a co it's a common problem. So we want to give it a shared language so that when, you know, now when other ML engineers are talking about this, they can be like, ah, like check out a bridge schema. Like that, that may be something you might, that might be helpful for your, for your, your use case. 
And so that, I think that was kind of the idea of like using the, the term design patterns. It's like common solutions to common problems. And then just like going through the different elements of the machine learning workflow um, and discussing, you know, common patterns that arise. And then, you know, some of them are very common. Some of them, some of them are maybe you, you've, you've seen before. Some of them maybe you haven't. But ideally, it'll give you the right language so that when you do come across that, you now have some ideas on how to approach those problems. I love it. And I love that your book gives me- Oh, wait, me... I think you're, um, maybe you're on mute. I don't hear you anyway. Oh, hi. You don't hear me? Oh, there you go. Okay. No, now I hear you. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. I, I was just saying, and I like that there are several design patterns that I have not seen before. Even though when yeah. I read it, like the bridge schema, I was like, oh, that totally makes sense. And why, why is nobody talking about it? It's so yeah, interesting. yeah. It's like, it's, 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 a, really... it's a thing that's small enough people ignore, but it's big enough, like everyone encounter at some point of their machine learning data science projects. Yeah, exactly. It's the kind of thing where it's like, you know, it makes a lot of sense. They're intuitive solutions. And it, it's probably something you may have come, with, come up with on, on your own, but then also, you know, if you, when you're reading the book, like if you, if you haven't come across that, like ideally now it may have you, your mind may go there and you'll think about it. Or maybe when you're talking with somebody and they use that term bridge schema, you know, there'll be a common reference. You can be like, okay, well, what is that? And like, now they'll, they'll have the words to use rather than having this long description of like, okay, look, you have this, this set up. And so you'll see that sort of echoed throughout all the chapters, all the sections in the book as well. But the way we talked, the way we wrote and the way we, we like, we thought about it was a sort of like, you know, talking with, with lack, like it was like, you know, you want to write these chapters in, in the, in the, in the context of like, if you were talking to a colleague at work, so you're, you're talking to a colleague at work, they have a background in machine learning. They know machine learning. Um, this is sort of like a machine learning 2.0 or 201 class. <laughs> and, and so you want to sort of discuss like, what is the problem that they're, 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 they're working, they're, they're working on that they have, what is like that common solution, like the bridge schema solution. And then you'll see that every, every pattern we discuss has like, um, you know, like, a how, it, like why it works, like a, a very light inner idea of like, what's the, the motivating idea behind this path, the solution. And then we discuss the trade-offs and alternatives. And the trails and alternatives are really kind of like, you know, maybe what you were just alluding to. It's like, you've probably come across some of these things before. And if you have, if you, it, you, you're aware of like the caveats or like the trade-offs of using that, but if you haven't, then you want to, you want to like, you know, know, like these are the trade-offs of using that design pattern. Here's the things you may have to choose, like, you know, you know, just so you're aware of it. Or if, if, you know, if you don't want to use that, like here's some alternatives, like that, that might, that might suit the same purpose. So it's sort of like written in a very conversational tone, uh, somewhat to, to like, to give an idea of, of what the common solutions would be. And then, um, and you know, like you probably come across them and you're, if you're, if you've been working as a, like, like George, you're saying you're a machine learning engineer for like th three years now, like you've probably seen a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, problems arise. Maybe you didn't have the right words for it or something. But then now hopefully you do. And then also going forward, if you if you feel like you come across a problem that you don't haven't seen before, then maybe this will give you an idea of like how to approach it. I definitely appreciate the conversational writing style. It's so much easier to read. <laughs> yeah. <it's> so much. <laughs> yeah. So um, George and uh, Yoma, do you guys have questions? Okay, let me know if you have any. If not, I'll just keep asking. Yeah, yeah. I have a ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I, I appreciate it. And also, if, there, if it's easier to ask questions in chat, feel free to drop questions in chat. And I can I can do that too. Yes, exactly. Um, so next question: What is your favorite design pattern? There are so many, and I really like that in the last chapter you have a table. Uh, just listed all the design patterns. It's just so much easier to refer back to which ones are in which section. That's pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. Like we, we, we sort of been had planning to write like a summary chapter and that summary chapter is sort of at the, you know, it's kind of thing that sort of like writes itself at the end of the day. Like you, you get to that point <clears throat> and it's like, okay, now you have, you've gone over so many patterns and like, they're pretty like digestible. They're pretty small. So it's like, you know, and like I said before, like they're sort of, they're arranged, the chapters are arranged in like different components of like the machine learning workflow. And so that one like final chart is just like, okay, here's, here's everything is a quick reference. 
but as as far as like a favorite design pattern <laughs> that's so fun it's so tricky i i don't know uh i guess i guess the, i guess the ones that i i like the most are probably maybe even the ones that are like Either the ones that are like the most ubiquitous, like you'll you'll see you sort of see them everywhere, and it sort of has like helped shape my understanding of machine learning. Things like like the embedding design pattern. I know it's like these are like probably more boring, but it's just like it's it's sort of like the heart of of machine learning, which I I, I kind of like. Right. Um, I also kind of like the feature store design pattern. It's 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 a it's it was an interesting one because uh in writing that in writing that section it was like, you know, feature stores have sort of there was they still felt a little bit new i know they've been around for a while now and so i found that that chop that section like a little bit I, I i never used one actually that was one of the ones where like i knew the solution existed but i've never actually built one with a customer and so um i kind of like that section because i had to like kind of learn a lot to, to to like to like really immerse myself and understand like how that actually how that actually works and it's kind of like it's one of those ones where it's it's a really difficult problem and i really came to appreciate like you know how difficult of a problem that is to solve um and uh so it's in that sense it's like it's like a very nice solution um but then at the same time you know it's it's kind of like a it's kind of like, it's not like a, a one size fits all and like there'll be a lot of situations where you know it's a it's a it's a great solution for a, a certain type of problem and so it's sort of like has this property of like any kind of field where it's a, a common solution to a common problem but you know, you really want to make sure you're using it in the right context. And so it's like a cool, it's like, it's like a really useful solution. There's also a lot of like important trade-offs and alternatives you should be aware of. It's like not, probably, it may not necessarily be the answer to all your problems. Totally makes sense. I totally agree. And I really like that you included some of the fundamental uh, concept like embeddings early on in your chapter. Um, yeah. So are there any design patterns that you wish you have included in the book since it's been a year old? Uh, still kind of <laughs> new, but a lot of things has happened in the last year, probably. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know, I think like, I think there are probably, you know, we, we sort of like, we, when we're figuring out what the patterns to include. We ended up with this like very round number of 30 and it seemed seemed to fit and it didn't feel like at the time it didn't really feel like anything was left out or like we had you know included anything we didn't need to include it sort of like felt really right i think maybe more and, and like this is probably from my more personal perspective there were certain areas where I, I would have liked to have gone deeper like i kind of felt like there's more to say there and like for example the very last chapter um which is the one on like stakeholder management uh, there are design patterns, if I remember correctly, I don't have the clients from my head right now, but it's like, if I remember, there's a, there's a section on like, um, you know, uh, baselines, like having, having a good baseline, uh, for communicating with, with stakeholders and also in, in developing your model, which is also one of my favorite <laughs> patterns. It's just cause it's such a useful and can be very in tricky, tricky and intriguing kind of obvious, but tricky, tricky pattern to employ sometimes. Um, and then there's a section on. Uh, heuristic benchmark or ex explainable that's it, that's it. yeah the, the heuristic benchmark it's um okay. it's like you want to have like a good baseline that you can use to communicate with stakeholders and also as you're as an engineer as you're developing you want to have a baseline that you know you're improving on and i like that pattern it's like one of the ones where it's like it seems really obvious but sometimes and i'm always surprised that this is the case but sometimes it's really hard to find what a good ben benchmark is um when things get really complicated and are, are in difficult systems um, and there's two other the patterns we discussed in that last chapter on explainability and fairness. And I think personally for me, I, it's like those those two areas in particular I'm really interested in. And so I felt like, you know, I wouldn't, I would have liked to have seen, uh, had had more room to go into more depth into those, those two patterns. And I should say, actually, as a result of like, you know, working on the book and like, you know, work talking about those patterns, when the book was finished, I was like, it would it'd be nice to go deeper into like explainability and fairness. And so then I talked to O'Reilly and we actually have a book coming out next month, another a new book on explainability. So oh my um, gosh, seriously? I need to, yeah. I need to get that one too. Uh, yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> keep, an eye, keep an eye out. So it's like right now in the um, we just finished it's right now it's like the cop is like the final stages of publishing. So it should come out in October. Congrats. Um, What's the name? 
it's a explainable AI for practitioners. And so it, that book, the purpose is obviously a little bit different, but um, it really did come out of working on this, on this book, like that last chapter and like talking about explainability and explainability is such a huge field and it's such an important toolkit for, for practitioners um, that I really wanted to like go deeper into it. And so um, we wrote a proposal and I, I, I talked to some colleagues at, at Google and you know uh, myself and then this uh, a guy, David Pittman, who is the, the technical lead of the explainable AI for Google Cloud was really interested in working on it also. And, and it was a great, he, he was great too, because in his role, I'd like worked with a lot of cloud customers and, you know, and on, on, on explainability and built out the explainability functionality in Google Cloud on the Google Cloud platform. And so, and so yeah, so we, we've been working on that the last, the last year or so. And I'm excited to see it sort of wrapping up. And it, it really just goes through like a deep dive, a deep, a really deep <laughs> dive into explainability, book on explainability. The different techniques, but with a with a practitioner in mind. So it's like every chapter is sort of focused on techniques. It's like a technique chapter on like if you're working with image data, or if you're working with text data, or if you're working with tabular data um, that are very technique focused. Similar to the structure of the design pattern book, where it's like here's a technique, here's what you need to know. You know, when you're using any technique, you should be aware of the hyperparameters that you're choosing and and what effect they have. So like how to get you up to speed right away on it on a a plethora of techniques and then there's you know chapters in the beginning and the end um, that are focused on the bigger picture of explainability like how do you incorporate explainability into your machine learning workflow like it's not a tack on of like a nice to have it's kind of like an essential tool that you as a data scientist or like as a machine learning engineer should have in your toolkit that you can help you debug and understand model model behavior a little bit better yes so uh, completely that'll agree. Be fun. I'm super yeah, interested you, uh, as well, and I am super excited about your new book. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, if people are interested, we can come back and talk about that in a, in a few months. <laughs> I, know, I know, we'll definitely have that. Um, oh, yeah, we have a question from Yoma. Yeah. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Jubal. Uh, I, I logged in from my wife's phone, so uh, it, it shows up as Yoma, but uh, uh, it, I'm a systems engineer at uh, Neuro, uh, and I work on the right-hand side of uh, machine learning engineers. So I work on, I work with machine learning engineers and I tell them when their model is good enough to be deployed. So, um, okay. I, uh, so my question will be more focused on the validation side of things. Um, I noticed you had, a, you had a short chapter on that in your book um, for continuous evaluation. And I found that interesting. Uh, and I think that makes sense. We have similar checks and balances. But, but I had a separate question and I was curious to get your thoughts on that. It's, uh, let's say we have a time series prediction. We have our training data. We have our predictions. We have our um, uh, ground truth. And we get a certain RMAC value, uh, the, diff the diff between the two time series. Uh, how do you know what RMSE is good enough in this case? So like when, when can you say, okay, uh, I think we've made a huge mistake. Like, cause it's, it's such a hard, cause, cause in my yeah. mind, when I look at such singular values, it, it's hard to see what the threshold over the error bound is. Uh, yeah. So I was curious if you have come across this in your experience or. That's a that's a really good question. It makes me think like, you know, what, what you're what you're describing is really difficult, and it can be difficult. And like you mentioned a time series problem, when I think time series can make things a little bit harder to evaluate sometimes. Like the way you approach time series data may be a little bit like those problems sort of have their own kind of flavor of 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 uh, of solutions and their own difficulties. But but what you just described is actually a problem that that I think is is throughout all machine learning projects. And it, anytime you're building a machine learning solution, that idea of like knowing when good enough is good enough. And um, let me let me talk really broadly, answer your question like broadly, and then maybe I can say a little bit more about about time series in particular. But like you know, in in our in you know in in, in the role I mean, my role is like an ML engineer in Google Cloud, working with with customers who are built like you know to build a machine learning sort of solution. And even now in my role um, as a as a software engineer in Google research, you know, it, you know, 
in both cases, it's like you're working with a customer. And I, in the first case, it was like a Google Cloud customer. Now I work with like internal Google product. They're, they're the customer. So like maybe like YouTube or, or Geo or something like that. But any kind of engagement that we start, that we start out with, it, it begins with that first conversation. There's that one, there's one chapter in the book. I think it's actually maybe in the, that last, that last like summary chapter where we talk about like the different steps of a machine learning workflow. It's like a, it's like the machine ML life cycle where it sort of starts off at like defining a use case and you go through like data collection and like building your model and like you iterate on that process. But that, that very first, and, and then you get to like deployment and then continuous model evaluation. And then, you know, it sort of like brings you back to where you started. <laughs> But that very first step is like is, is is crucial, right? And and projects I've been on that have failed or are you know really suffered is because we we lacked exactly what you're describing, where there's not a clear definition of what success looks like, and it's really mm -hmm. a difficult it's a really difficult problem, and it really requires um, a conversation between like engineers who are going to be delivering that project, and but primarily is is that one time when you have a meeting with like the stakeholders also, and so. You know, in my role, you know, as a as a as an ML engineer in cloud, that would all look like a kickoff. Like we would have one big meeting where you know we would be there as the ML engineers building the solution, but that's when we would meet the, um, you know, like the 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 C, like the director level people of the company, um, or at least like you know the managers who 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 had an idea and it had been communicated exactly what the goal was for this machine learning model. And what success looked like, and um, and you know, it's the kind of thing where you're not just building a model for fun. Like you, you, you're building a model to suit to serve a purpose, and so defining what that purpose is, you know, is really important. And and uh, and us as engineers, like we were, we were sort of like there also to to fact check, not fact check, but just like if things weren't feasible, like that was our chance to say, like, this is not a fee, this is not a good use case for machine learning. And a lot of times that that's how the conversation would end is us saying it's not a good use case, but assuming all that worked out. Okay. Then, then it came down to saying, okay, like you have the data. It's a good problem for machine learning. We can do this. Um, what does success look like? And that's exactly the question we would ask at the very, very beginning. And it's really important to know how to do, how, what that is, because as you, the minute you get into the weeds and you're like, your day to day, like you're building a model and you're struggling with like TensorFlow errors, you know, you, you really, you really quickly, you're just like trying to get something to work and like, you know, work in a more complex system that you lose sight of like, what are we trying to do? Like, what's, what, what is the goal? What's success? And so, you know, it's the kind of thing where before you even start touching, it's like good experiment design before you even start touching and like building a solution, you want to be clear about what's going to be enough, like what's good enough. You know, now, now, you know, in my role, um, you know, we will meet with like a product team and then it's very, it's very clear. It's like, we have these metrics that we have been ca capturing, you know, already, like in that case, they already have like a good benchmark. That heuristic benchmark already exists in the sense that they have a model already deployed. They're using it. It has good performance and they want to see if we can improve it with some new technique. And, you know, there it's, it's very clear. And they'll say like, if you can, if you can get like an improved 1% on like the RMSE or whatever the metric is or they're measuring, then we can put that model into production. Like it's worth, it's, it's worth it for us to put into production. Um, it's, if you don't have a benchmark, if you don't have a model in, in place that you're trying to beat, then it, then it really is like you saying, what is our heuristic benchmark? Like, what are we beating? Like, what, what are we doing now? And What's our goal? And you mentioned like an eval metric like RMSE. And I think that's important because like a lot of times I find in these like real life use cases, that's that's typically not, you know, that that you're you're that maybe not actually what you're trying to improve. Like meaning you have an eval metric that you're trying to improve and you're sort of like you're building a model that can do a better job at predicting to to have a better eval metric. But at the end of the day, the goal is like more customers or like less churn or something like that. And so like you, to maybe bring it back down to like your question about time series, you know, maybe what that looks like is you, you have certain eval metrics <clears throat> that you're, that you're measuring that you can sort of give you confidence to say, okay, maybe now we can put this model in production and like test it against some benchmark that we already have in place. But usually the best, the best answer is something is something like, you know, does it, how it ties back to the business, like, how, and, 
and and that's that's usually from probably from your perspective um of like as a systems engineer of like knowing you know working with engine like, you know to de deploying these models and putting them in you know actually putting them in production that's probably the best metric to know like when good enough is enough is like you know if you're if you can really beat a benchmark that currently exists or you can that whatever your final goal was for this machine learning model if you can show that it it leads to improvement and and market market improvement then that's then that's 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 sort of the answer that's worth why that's that's why but it it's the caveat is like it's it's really difficult like it's something you i think you have to talk about with stakeholders at the very beginning of any project so you kind of know what your goal your north star is and like what you're aiming for and and don't let that move as you start developing like you don't want to change that based on how easy or difficult things become um and then you know the the, the use of having benchmarks in place is really handy because you can say like can we beat what's currently being done and if we can beat it by a certain amount that that might be what we want to do uh and there's one more thing i was going to say which was um uh well maybe it just lost me if it comes back i'll i'll, I'll, I'll mention it but uh uh but yeah, it all comes down to, I think it's just like, yeah, that's like, usually it's something you want to define early in, in advance. And then, um, and then, uh, oh, that's what I was going to say. You mentioned continuous model evaluation. Like, you know, another thing to be aware of is like, what I just said makes sense. It's like, okay, cool. Great. Like you, you have your eval metric, you have a conversation before you start your project, you agree with the business stakeholders, what good enough is. And I know I haven't answered your questions precisely on what good enough is because it changes depending on the use case. So it's really impossible to say like 1% is, is good enough. But, but the, the challenge of this sometimes is also in the implementation when you have that ground truth, like how do you know what, 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 the, what the best answer is? Like I mentioned the example of, of customer churn it's like, sure, like you're trying to decrease customer churn. Sometimes you may not even know, especially for time series data, um, you may not even know the ground truth uh, for for maybe a month later. Like, you know, if, if you're predicting customer churn, you know, p customer subscriptions may not be renewed for, you know, maybe a quarter or like a year later. So so predicting when a customer is not going to renew their subscription, you don't even know the ground, have the ground truth uh, until you know, in the, in the future, if you're predicting like, you know, next quarter's revenue, like you don't have the answer in, in, until like the next quarter. So time series can make that difficult because, um, you know, we talk about it in the context of continuous model evaluation, but, but it also makes it difficult in the context of knowing when good enough is good enough, because you're measuring these things, you have these things. If your ultimate goal is improving, you know, customer churn, like you may not actually be able to say, is the model good enough until next quarter? And then it's like, is that the right to like the, the that's the right time cycle. And so it can it can get really difficult, but it's the kind of thing you want to figure out as early as possible and then um, you know, find ways to mitigate that. And I think that that continuous model evaluation is a good example of where like we discuss, you know, that issue, that issue of like not having your ground truth solution ground truth answer ground truth uh you know for you know any, any data example you know in time and how you might address that problem but i think the same is true for knowing when good enough is good enough like maybe you can apply some of those same ideas to 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 that that context as well that's a very long answer but i think maybe i touched on some of the things <laughs> you asked <laughs> no, no that is good uh thank you so much for answering that question i i think that i think that makes sense um that some of these things changes over time and I have a follow-up and I was curious to know your thoughts on this is you, you talked about your uh, model going stale because the data you trained on is no longer relevant and, and your current data has now changed over time. Does it also make sense to have a test data set that changes over time or, or how, how do you or tackle this problem? Uh, because Yeah, I guess the idea is like what you're the whole, like very broadly speaking, you're just you're trying to find a way what you're trying to build a model that journalizes to unseen data like that's kind of the goal of machine learning like very loosely and so the test data set exists to do that like the test data set exists to, to give you to show, tell you when you see unseen data you can expect this behavior because test data set you've never touched it in development so you know 
if if your if your real data is changing over time, then you're you know you're building your model in a moment. It's likely that your test data also is going to change over time, right? So so likely when you're you're, you're doing your development process, you know you're going to take your data that you're going to use to build your model, and then and then you're going to separate it and say, okay, this is my test data, this is my training, this is my validation data. So this idea of like continuous model evaluation is like you've evaluated your model on your test data now. But if you think about it, it's a proxy. That test data is a proxy for the actual real world. Like you're trying to get as close as you can to what happens in the wild. And that test data in development is meant to be wild, unseen data. But the, the true wild unseen data is the data that happens in the in the in the wild in, in in when the when the model is deployed. Like you know, what happens like truly in the wild. And so what you'll probably find is that um and 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 even even if the distributions like even just like the way people interact with the model can affect the behavior, like can affect with you know, affect like the type of examples that are that come that are being served to the model and once it's been deployed. So that, that gets pretty tricky, but but to answer your question about like you know should the test data also you know change with time it's like ideally when once you deploy it like that your your model in production is now seeing ostensibly test data data that model was not trained on and not used for development so you know the continuous model evaluation is meant to catch when your the true test data the, the real data um, starts to deviate from whatever you use for development so. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the way I think about it in terms of like. I think so. I, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No worries. So when people talk about like continuous data monitoring, um, continual learning, I'm just wondering why don't they just like keep training your model on new data as soon as they can, they can, so that they don't need to bother. <laughs> yeah. Monitor. <laughs> I don't know. Well, what one issue is like, you know, once the model is deployed, like updating your model can be a lot of work. And I, I mean, I think maybe I missed your yeah. name, Joel, uh, before, but if I, let me, if I got that right. But like, that's a good example. It's like, you know, once the, getting the model, like building a model, like developing a model and like you're in a Jupyter notebook and you're like running experiments or you're working on like Google Cloud and you're training a model with new data and like, and you finally are able to say like, okay, cool. Like our model has accuracy of, you know, 98%, like we've improved our previous, our previous model this much, you know, um, that's a lot of development. And then, and, and a lot of choices of hyperparameters and uh, based on your data set and based on your model architectures, like, you know, there's a lot of choices you make when you're, when you're building out a model, a solution like that. And so, uh, and so you, you kind of, you kind of found the best solution for the data you had at the time. And then, and then you go into the process of like deploying the modeling, getting it into production. And that's a lot, it's a huge effort. And like, you know, there's size constraints and latency constraints and all these issues. So even though it may be in your mind, you think like, oh, it's just really simple. Like a new data example comes in, you train your model and then update your production. Like that's, that may be a nice scenario, but rarely do I have I ever seen like a automated, a system so well automated that you can do that efficiently. Like, you know, update your model, deploy it again, you know, like have, have, you know, have a check to make sure it's meeting what's currently in production. But the reason why you probably even want to be careful, even if you had that at a flip of a switch, you want to be careful using it is because like, it, it could also just be causing noise in your, in your, in your model. Like, like think about doing gradient descent when you're training a model, like there's, you have this, 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 you know, getting really into the weeds like this training step where you take a bunch of data and you you use it to update your model parameters and you know you don't want to take you can't usually take the whole data set um and so you're taking many batches right and like the the the, the most extreme example is a, a single mini batch like a single example is a single mini batch and then you update your model based on the the, the what one what one training example tells you to do but if you look at the if you look at the convergence of of model the training when you use that extreme version of stochastic gradient descent it's incredibly noisy right because one example says oh you got it wrong 
go here, update your model parameters, go this direction. And then you get another example. It's like, okay, you got it wrong again. Now go this way. So you sort of jump around a lot. And there's kind of a sweet spot of like what size of a batch is good. You know, there's some recent research that suggests that the full data set is probably sufficient. And, but, but the, but there, but, but ignoring sort of like these kind of like newer ideas, there's a sweet spot of how big of a batch you want to use to get the best model. And so even though you may be getting new data every, every day, like a new training example or a new training example, every five minutes or so, it doesn't mean that if you use that example, it's going to give you a better model. It may uh, just cause confusion and that actually may be worse. And it's possible that you train, you update, you retrain your model on new data and you get worse performance. And it's like, okay, let's not deploy that model then. So, you know, that process of like knowing when, you know, having an AB test of knowing when to use a different model or when to retrain and update, it can, it may sound easy, but usually it's really, usually it's a lot of work and you probably don't even want to anyway. Like it probably wouldn't, wouldn't improve things. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, oh, wait, you're, um, there's not, I think you might just again. Oh, there you go. Now. <laughs> I think you just take a, take a few seconds to register. But no reason. I think I just, I'm talking too much. And so then uh, it's <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so most of your book is like having code examples, which is like super helpful. Um, there are a lot of them are using TensorFlow. I'm a PyTorch user. I wonder like if you use PyTorch or not. <laughs> yeah, we, we tried our very best to make the code samples be as, I was gonna say, yeah, as like, as like flexible as possible. Like we're, we're all coming from Google Cloud. And so, so and, and, you know, in Google. So like, I think we had a bias towards like things like TensorFlow naturally. And so we tried to include wherever we could like PyTorch examples and, and make it as cloud agnostic as possible because like these patterns aren't special to Google in any, in any way. Um, so there, so there may be a few examples of things of like some PyTorch in there every once in a while, but definitely I, I admit like my, my go-to is usually TensorFlow, but that's just like, I, I think that's just my background. Like, I think that's the kind of pro like having worked at Google for a while, that that's what we use um, a lot, but I will say like, I have worked with PyTorch a bit on various customer projects. Like if a customer comes to us and they want to build a model in PyTorch, like we're not going to tell them, no, you should be using TensorFlow. Like PyTorch is great actually. <laughs> and, you know, and, 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 you know, to accommodate that, like if, if you want to build and develop and train a, a PyTorch model of Google cloud, like you can just as easily with TensorFlow uh, as you can with TensorFlow. Um, so yeah, to answer your question is like, I have, I have used some, I have used PyTorch for, for some customer projects. Um, I feel like I haven't had to get really, and even this explainability, like there are a lot of like nice libraries that are written in PyTorch. And so like to write the code examples for that explainability book we were doing, I was like, you know, reminding myself a lot of, a lot of PyTorch. And I, I don't know, like, <laughs> I agree if we have to cut something out. Yeah. Like I, 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 I it's a, it's an, it's really nice. It's really nice to use. And sometimes I feel like you move, I can develop a little bit faster with PyTorch than I can with TensorFlow sometimes, like depending on what I want to do. Um, you know, one thing I like about TensorFlow that I've experienced is like, I can really change anything I want to. Like in a lot of some projects I work on now, like we really are getting into like every single aspect you wanna, you wanna customize, you can. I've never tried that with PyTorch, so I don't know how customizable things are. So maybe it has that same level, but, um, so there's probably going to be kind of those pros and cons, but as a, at, at an entry level of like building models, I think it's great. Like I really like PyTorch. Like it's a really good, it's a really good library. Yeah, they're both amazing tools. Um, when yeah. I first learned uh, deep learning, I was actually learning TensorFlow. And now I feel like PyTorch is kind of picking up. <laughs> it's picking up, and, and actually, I like what you said. Like they're both tools, and yeah. and this is where I try to like keep in mind for anybody I talk to is like, as a practitioner, like you should have a, a toolkit and you should feel comfortable like having, knowing which tool to use. And, you know, there's different tools serve different purposes. And so, um, so that's a good way of thinking about it. It's like, they're both, they're both good tools. And so sometimes you may find yourself like 
using one or the other. And sometimes you don't have a choice, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's like, if, if you find yourself like working on projects over and over in PyTorch, then it's probably, that, that makes sense too. That's great. Um, anyone else have questions? I have a career question. What is a research software engineer? <laughs> oh yeah, sure. So, um, <laughs> so my, so yeah, so my role now is, um, so, uh, my background's in mathematics. I did like my, a PhD and postdoc in, in pure math and then worked as a professor before coming to Google. So um, my background is sort of more in like the academic, uh, like research kind of side of things. And then and, and when I was a mathematician, my work, my research was focused in like um, geometric analysis and topology, like very like esoteric kind of mathematics stuff, which I really like. And then, uh, and then when I got into machine learning, you know, I started like learning the tools of machine learning and it was like cool to like build things that people were gonna be, gonna be using. And so, uh, I worked as an ML engineer in cloud where I was like using the machine learning concepts, but like, you know, the goal was to build, you know, a model for a customer and like, you know, get that model deployed and have the customer using that model. The research software engineer, I think, I mentioned those two backgrounds because I think it sort of bridges both really well. So re research software engineer, it's like, it's, it's a software engineering part, right? So that means like my primary role is like writing code at Google and developing you know, new models for Google product teams like YouTube or Geo or, um, or maybe even like uh, cloud product teams. Uh, so, you know, that, that's the software engineering part is like I'm building machine learning models, you know, in code, like, you know, to be, to be used at Google, like they're, to, to, like they're, they're gonna be used for, for Google products. The research part is more on the, uh, is exactly the, 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 the mathematics like research side of it. So. The other half of my job is to do like fundamental research in machine learning. So, you know, I'm also like, we also have a paper in NeurIPS this year that you might wanna, if you're, if you're, if you wanna talk about papers. <laughs> um, so, so there are the goal is like to, to write research papers. And so like, you know, the paper that we have coming, that's gonna be in, in NeurIPS in, in December this year is uh, a paper on, um, more on like the foundational understanding of machine learning, kind of like very basically like why does why does machine learning work so well? Like why does gradient descent work so well? Meaning when you back to this conversation about generalizing on unseen data, like neural networks are able to generalize well, even when they're like over parameterized. Like, you know, you have this classical idea of building a machine learning model where there's a sweet spot of the capacity of your model. Like you don't want to you know, have too many parameters because then you're going to overfit your data. You don't have too few parameters because then you're going to not have enough, have enough uh, parameters to learn your data. There's a bias variance trade-off. That's like sort of a classical regime of machine learning. But over the last few years, people have found that as you increase the size of your models and you increase the number of parameters, then there's this double descent phenomena where your models start to actually perform well on unseen data, even in the overparameterized setting. And, and what's happening is, you know, you're starting to interpolate the data of your training data set and your model does well on, on new data. And, and that's a big question that no one really understands super well. Like no one, it's a question mark in machine learning. Like, why does that, why does that work? And it seems very basic. Like what about gradient descent? What about machine learning causes the models that are found to be good models that generalize well? And so we wrote a paper that aims to try to understand that a little bit better by introducing a new complexity measure. And it uses ideas from geometric analysis of saying like, when you look at the functions that are being learned and you measure the Dirichlet energy of those functions, pretty amazingly, we found that, that, uh, that what happens is that, that Dirichlet energy is actually controlled in a nice way during gradient descent. So it's, um, it's there's there's mechanisms, implicit mechanisms at play in gradient descent that control the complexity of your model that encourage the models to be simple solutions to, to and simple solutions generalize better. So, so, that's so a what is that math term again? Uh, I don't know anything about it. Wait, which term? The 
the term that defines the complexity of the model. Oh, the uh, the dear clay energy. Yeah. But what is that? So that <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. That's a that's a it's a concept that's very familiar from mathematics and harmonic analysis, and it's a way of measuring the variability of a function. It's it's a it's an integral of the norm of the derivative of the function. <laughs> So it may, I, if I had a chalkboard, I could like write it down and show you more clearly, but maybe to give you some intuition, I think it's probably more useful anyway. The Dirichlet energy is measuring the variability of your function. And um, it's sort of, you can think of it like it, it, it's, it's, it's sort of like controlling the, the stretchiness of your function. So if you had a, the, the example that we show in the paper and that, that I think it, it illustrates it really well is if you take a, a very simple data set of like a few points in the plane, <laughs> like just a few points in the plane, like 10 points, and you take a massive neural network, like a, a neural network of like thousands of parameters to learn that data set, then you know, you can think in your mind, like, what do you think your model is going to learn? Like, what's it going to learn? If you give it so many parameters, the model that's going to be learned, it probably isn't surprising, is going to be like a, a piecewise linear solution of like line segments that connect those data points. And that's because you've given it thousands of parameters and it's learned, it's gotten zero training error, it's memorized your data, but in between your data points, it's a very, you know, it's a straight line, like just connecting those two points. But if you think about it, like, if you think about it like that, that, that doesn't, that shouldn't necessarily happen. Like gradient descent, all gradient descent does is like find a solution that has zero error. But another solution that has zero error is a function that goes up and down and wiggles around and hits every single point perfectly, but you know, has zero training error, but has a high variability. And so what we claim is that, I mean, we saw in a very simple experiments and we ended up showing it on like large scale experience using like CIFAR 10 and, and things like that you know, these academic data sets, we, set, we found that the, the, that Dirichlet energy is controlled during the training process. Like it's, it's kept small so that the solutions that, that it actually finds are those straight line solutions that are like um, piecewise linear solutions. You know, the intuition you have for that, for that example I just described. Is that um, coincidental or is that? Because the variability of your function is controlled. So it's a, it's, and it's a function from, it's an idea from harmonic analysis. There's like a Dirichlet's principle, which is like harmonic functions minimize the Dirichlet energy. So it seems that when you're training models with neural, neural networks, there's some notion of that kind of like Dirichlet energy being controlled during the training process in a meaningful way. Gotcha. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you for explaining. Yeah. So there's a little bit of like the research aspect of a research software engineer, but that's, that's, that's kind of what it is. It's like the research part where you're like doing like fundamental research and like understanding what is like, I, I care about the mathematics of it. So I care about like, you know, what's the mathematical foundations of machine learning. And then the software engineering part, which is like, okay, now you know that fact, cool. Like we've proven something. We have a nice like mathematical theory that justifies it. How can we use that theory to like improve models at Google or build some new tool that can be used? And so the research is, this, the software engineering part sort of takes those research ideas and then applies them in a meaningful way to improve Google Google products. That's kind of the idea. Those two rules so. sounds so different. How do you balance those? Like, how do you get the skills yeah. of both? <laughs> yeah, that's hard. <sighs> I think it's like, I think the way it's balanced is, is on, on projects. Like sometimes, and I, which I really like a lot, because like, you know, if you're doing a research project, like I, before when I was a professor, I would just do research and it can be, it can be, you're in your head a lot and it can be hard to, you know, get perspective. Um, and so the, I think the, the good way to balance it is exactly that. Like, you know, I'll work on a research project for a while and then like, but then when you're writing code, there it's very clear like when you've done a good job <laughs> like it's like either your code works or it doesn't work <laughs> and it's a little bit more like you know clear and so i think that's a good way of balancing it is that like the ideas are what excite me the ideas i think are you know i find research really compelling and there's a lot of like, new ideas always happening and it's a very active area of research and i love talking to the smart people i work with and like learning from them and like seeing what new ideas there are but then the software engineering part is like okay now we're gonna like code something up and 
and like put it into into practice and and there it's almost like a little more tangible and you can you can know when you've when you've done a good job and so you know it, it works out in they will come in it comes in cycles too like you'll spend a lot of time working on a research idea and then usually that transitions into implementation and so then you're doing a lot of coding and then like right when i get sick of doing too so much coding it's like time to wrap that up there's like some new research ideas that are bubbling up that we want to go back to so usually when it works out well it's a good balance between the two and you can sort of like focus on one or the other depending on on like of course like priorities but also like where you are in the moment and as far as like developing the skills for both for me i think people that i work with they sort of came from all different backgrounds so you know it's it's hard to say there's like one there's not one path so it's like you know, I, my path was I went really deep on the math side, obviously. And then, and, you know, I was doing pure math, so I did zero coding. And then, uh, and then I started to like learn how to code and I learned how to code well enough, just uh, enough, I think, to be able to like implement some of these ideas I was seeing in the mathematics. But I know other people I work with who are, who are really great that I, I learn a ton from. And I'm, you know, again, like really happy to work with them is like, and their backgrounds may be more from computer science. And so like they, they learn, they're excellent coders. Like they're, they're really top notch. And they, then they learned from coding, they got interested in research and they started like reading papers and like you know, building experiments. And so they came from the exact opposite direction, but we kind of landed in the same place together doing the same thing. Um, just because I don't know, it's how we, how our skills develop. So yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like all over the shop, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you have a perfect job for yourself. Uh, so far, I like it a lot. It's good. Like so far, I, I, re I really enjoy it. Like it's yeah. interesting projects and it's like good people. And um, it's like a good balance of like, I can convince myself that I'm doing interesting, important research work, but also important, impactful, you know, product work. So it's cool. Like so far, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you like the both worlds. I feel yeah. like uh, <laughs> the world need more people like you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's it, I wish. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I guess that's all my questions. Anyone else have questions or do you have any words for us? Any other questions? Um, if not, I'll just say, Honestly, thanks again. Like it's been really nice chatting with you, Sophia. Like it's I was, you know, I I I really appreciate it. And uh it's been a really fun chat. So thanks for taking the time to let me ramble about things. And uh and again, like I'm really impressed with what you've done. Like this is really cool <laughs> that you um just put out a call to have a book club and you have a whole bunch of people who are like-minded who want to like learn some new things with you. So that's that's really impressive and uh and well done and again like like you said at the very beginning it's the weekend uh, so i'm surprised <laughs> i'm surprised anybody's on the call <laughs> so so thanks thanks everyone for your time for like joining in even for a little bit uh on your weekends so thanks a lot thank you so much it's definitely thank my you. pleasure to talk to you today i feel like i've learned so much um cool yeah well thank you so much. like uh, i think I think you all can find me on LinkedIn and um, if you have any questions come up down the road, like, um, you know, feel free to reach out and uh, yeah, really great chatting with all of you. Well, I do. And we will definitely read your next book. Looking forward to it. <laughs> I, I, I'm for it. Explainability. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye. <laughs> have a good weekend. Bye.